Um, so welcome back. It's 1.30. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jessica Holmes and I'm serving as the interim board chair for the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, so a, a warm welcome to the whole Brattleboro team there. I see you're all in your conference room. That's great. Uh, we know there have been a lot of changes at Brattleboro um, over the last few months, so we look forward to meeting everybody. And it might be helpful as we as you all start, if you could introduce yourselves to the board and the staff, it'll also help our court reporter with names. And so I'm going to kick it over to all of you now for your presentation. Um, knowing that we have a, a tight schedule this afternoon, I'm going to hold all of the board and staff questions until the end of the presentation. And you, uh, Brattleboro team, you have until about 2.45 for your presentation. So Russ, could you please swear in the, the Brattleboro witnesses who are going to be speaking today and presenting? Of course, happy to. Um, if everyone can hear me from the Brattleboro team, uh, if you could identify who is going to be speaking this afternoon. Certainly. I'm Rhonda Calhoun. I'm chair of the board. And who will also be here with me today is uh, Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Griffey and Andre Bissonnet, our controller, Laura Bruno, Chief Medical Officer Kathleen McGraw, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Nursing Officer Jody Stack, Director of Development and Marketing, Gina Patterson, and our President and Chief Executive Officer, Chris Doherty. All right, terrific. Excuse me, please. Um, may I ask, request one more time for those names, a little slower, please? Of course. So I'm the Chair of the Board. My name is Rhonda Calhoun. Chief Financial Officers are Jennifer Griffey and Andre Bissonnette. Our Controller is Laura Bruno. Chief Medical Officer is Dr. Kathleen McGraw. Chief Operating Officer and Chief Nursing Officer, Jody Stack. Director of Development and Marketing, Gina Patterson. And our new President and Chief Executive Officer, Chris Doherty. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think the first time everybody speaks, if you could identify yourself by name too, that would be. Um, very helpful for us and for the court reporter. Absolutely. Are you ready for us to begin? I'm ready to swear you in. If everybody could, uh, who will be speaking, raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I, I do. do. Great, thanks very much. I will turn it back to, uh, you chair Holmes or over to the Brattleboro team? Yeah, great. I think I'll just turn it right over to the Brattleboro team. So whoever's kicking us off and if you could share your slides with us, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rhonda Calhoun. Again, I'm the chair of the board of directors. I've been chair and I've uh, been on the board of directors for the last five years, um, but have been involved with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital since 2012. So 10 years of volunteer service and also serving on various committees as well. So I have definitely seen this hospital at its best and definitely during some of its struggles. Um, the challenges of the, the past two and a half years um, have definitely put our hospital as well as probably every other hospital in the, in the United States um, in a very, very difficult time uh, with our shutdowns of uh, operating rooms and, and routine care, inflation, the uh, cost of medicine, the cost of medical equipment, the cost of staffing um, has just overwhelmed us all tremendously. We're very concerned about uh, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. No entity can withstand millions and millions of dollars of losses, and uh, we're hoping that there will be reasonableness in discussions with regard to our budget. Um, there are definitely opportunities for a turnaround. Um, we're starting, you know, as you know very well, uh, you know, we had to shut down in the beginning for several months, tried to start getting back up. We were doing well. And then again, we had to shut down again for another period of time, which has certainly crimped um, our any opportunities we had at that point. Our hospital is very vital to this community. We sit at the gateway to the state of Vermont. We serve as an excellent healthcare medical facility. We're a wonderful community partner with programs and outreach to all of our populations within our local community, and we're a major employer. This budget has been developed with the input of 
pretty much every single stakeholder possible. Every department has had a say in this budget, even medical staff, physicians, our doctor groups, everyone has played a part in developing this budget, which is a very responsible budget. And as I said, the input was gathered from everyone. So at that, I will just uh, lead you off that my leadership team, our leadership team, uh, dedicated and committed people that are behind me today and who are in every department in this hospital, they're going to present the details of this budget, where we are today, which is very important as to where we're going to be going and what we intend to uh, do about our future. So I thank you for listening. You can go one more, Laura, please. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Starty. I am the new president and CEO here, and I'd like to thank Rhonda for her comments, and I'd also like to thank you for your incredible leadership through these turbulent times. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> I have had the immense pleasure of being the president and CEO of Brattleboro Memorial Hospital for all of three months now. Even in that short time, I've been able to comprehend how vital a role this health system plays for this community. I remember my first images of Vermont were of the gorgeous trees that surround us here. And it's very fitting that the BMH logo is a tree. As I've pondered the tree as our logo, I've found that there is a very deep meaning of this logo. I see BMH as very, as very much like a tree. I draw the correlation based on a book, which was a bestseller, called The Hidden Life of Trees. I'll offer just a few of the similarities between BMH and trees. First, trees serve as our planet's lungs. They give off life-giving oxygen. Similarly, BMH serves as the lungs of our community here in Brattleboro. We strive to be the hub of hope, <laughs> help, and healing for the entire community. I believe the COVID pandemic and the role of BHF, BMH is a perfect example of being the lungs for this community. In the book, we find that trees can sense danger and learn and adapt. Right now, BMH is sensing danger as we are in a very fragile position due to a lot of complex issues. You're gonna hear more about it, the very high inflation that we're facing, workforce shortages, et cetera, and the talented team here will talk about those things. I'd like to take just a moment to give a very real life example of the challenges of mental health and workplace violence and how they converge here <clears throat> in a place like BMH. This morning, this Monday morning, a gentleman was released from prison. Historically, this gentleman has called 911 has been brought to our ED and carried out assaults 10 times, including throwing a coffee mug at one of our employees and punching a nurse in our ED in the face. This gentleman is not allowed to go to the homeless shelter. They have gotten a no trespass against him. He knows that if he calls 911, he will be brought here and we will have to assess his medical needs. We have in fact put him on a safety plan so that when he shows up, and he will, we assess him in the parking lot. This takes multiple staff members out of our ED for a very extensive period of time every time he comes in, and we have no idea when he's going to come in. We are sensing danger in our financial performance since we have done everything we can to develop a responsible, reasonable budget Finally, we learned that trees help one another. Likewise, BMH exists for that sole purpose of serving the wonderful community in which we reside. We seek approval of a reasonable, responsible budget so that we can serve and hopefully prevent any further degradation of service levels and access to essential services. I'm very fond of a quote from Winston Churchill. He once said, to improve is to change, to be perfect is to change often. We do not sit here before you professing perfection, not in the very least. We do want to emphasize how committed to constantly improving we are and how much we embrace the need for constant change in healthcare. 
Unfortunately, not all change leads to improvement in every area. The tough environment that we are in has created change that has had some negative impact on our service levels and access to our services as our capacity becomes more and more constrained. We seek to stop any further degradation and truly become the hub of hope, health, and healing for our entire community. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McGraw, our Chief Medical Officer, to talk about that hub of hope, health, and healing. Thank you, Chris. I wanna give a little details about the way in which we are a hub of hope, health, and healing. And uh, to start with, really, is looking at what our community impact is. BMH is an essential part of the fabric of this community. We identify the needs and bring in the needed resources to address issues, to allow for hope, health, and healing. We recognize the importance of getting ahead of these issues as well to provide actual impact on change and not just crisis response. And each of these changes we also recognize brings financial responsibility to the hospital. So some of the ways that we have had uh, help in healing more recently in our organization <coughs> includes things such as the dental program. We noted on several of our community health needs assessment <coughs> that dental need was high and referral options for those patients was slim to none. So we partnered with the United Way of Wyndham County and we now have a fully functional dental clinic. We recognize that births were trending down in not just our local community, but the region and the state as a whole, and that Springfield was financially stressed and closing their birthing center. And so we invested and brought births to BMH, keeping the numbers up for patient safety, patient, our clinician skill, as well as uh, convenience uh, for those patients. We also invested in prenatal care up at Springfield for patients' convenience, and brought in Dartmouth-Hitchcock providers to assist in the support uh, for neonatal nursery coverage. With respect to mental health, which we know is an ongoing issue in Vermont, uh, more so than in some other uh, places, we've worked together with our uh, local organizations such as Groundworks Collective, which is the local homeless uh, services organization, HCRS, which is our designated agency for mental health, and the Brattleboro Retreat. And between the four of us, we've been working to eliminate barriers to both medical and mental health care for folks who are experiencing homelessness or insecurity for their housing and also have simultaneously a mental health diagnosis, which we know is really uh, a recipe for a very, very difficult situation for them. And I would say that the work that we're doing with that is really groundbreaking. We are a major employer in our community. We take this responsibility very seriously. We've been here since 1904 as a hub and recognize that every position we have uh, is important uh, to those in our community. And so we evaluate every expanded position with, uh, with that gravity um, to ensure stability for the long-term hope health of our community. Um, we recognize the pay and the benefits that we bring to this community provide the baseline for our community's well-being. And in addition, we have uh, strong educational relationships and affiliations. And uh, Jody Stack, our Chief Nursing Officer, Chief Operating Officer, will uh, speak a little bit more specifically about some of those programs. But I want to say that we are a resource for careers, internships, education, and clinical experiences for folks. And we see that not just as a benefit for ourselves as uh, a way of uh, uh, creating future employees, but also as a hub of uh, education resources for our community uh, because it really helps ensure their future. Um, we are committed to the quadruple aim of improved population health, reduced cost, improved patient experience, and improved provider experience. And our work with value-based uh, excuse me, value-based care plans and One Care Vermont. Um, and our investments in population health really uh, align with that. And among other things, gives us great uh, data to use for ongoing quality improvements. And we have had substantial investments in quality um, to ensure that our health and healing can continue. And so the other key about this is ensuring access. Uh, so 
the access to care, as I know uh, Jessica Holmes will certainly agree, is really the key. And one of those keys is having it be local enough that people can actually get to it. Um, and so this is why for the past 10 years, we have transitioned to a largely employed uh, medical group model. Uh, and we have had a whole community of clinicians who have uh, been here for, uh, for really decades, who have come to retirement age and stepped away from medical care. And we have had to put together an employed medical group to ensure that we have ongoing access for our community. And at this point, most of primary care is actually, not all, but most of primary care is through BMH as a result. Um, we also have telehealth, another reason, um, uh, another important part of ensuring access. Telestroke, telepsych, teleICU, and more. And it lets us provide what a small community hospital has barriers to otherwise uh, providing in a cost-effective manner. We have local oncology and orthopedics so that those who are least able to travel, elders and those in pain, don't actually have to travel. And we have wound care in partnership with Hellogix and HIV care in partnership with UVMMC because we recognize that there were no comprehensive services for miles in any direction in, for those communities. We also created a post-acute care program to ensure that there was continuity of care for our patients who were entering the hospital and leaving to go to some skilled nursing facilities in the area. It's helped with our throughput ability, but as you've heard already today, and I'm sure we'll continue to hear over the next uh, few weeks, that uh, the throughput ability within our hospitals is quite difficult. But this post-acute care team has also uh, been able to provide attention to care to ensure that we can have successfully decreased readmissions for those patients that we discharge. And then and lastly, I want to remark that our strategic partnership with Dartmouth Health has been really essential for achieving all of this. Every, it means that every time that we see a need, we look at it from a regional perspective, think about how to more broadly leverage resources in the region to get patients what they need. And this has meant many collaborations with Dartmouth Health, our ED clinicians, our cardiologists, and many more. We're a hub for Hope Health and Healing, but that can't be without the resources necessary to ensure that. Vermont communities depend on us hospitals to manage issues that don't have other solutions. And so we have continually leveraged our relationships to provide our community with what it needs. But we've stretched every dollar to make opportunities uh, for our meeting our patients' needs. And we continually work with partner as partners with others and look forward to working with the state as a partner as well in order for us to have the resources we need to do this work. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Bruno and I'm the controller at BMH. We will begin the financial section of our presentation with a walkthrough of our financial projection for the remainder of fiscal 22. We enter these hearings in a difficult financial position with our projected operating margin estimated at a loss of $3.5 million. As of May 22, we have recorded a cumulative operating loss of $2.3 million or a negative 3.5% margin. We're projecting a $3.5 million operating loss for the full fiscal year, FY22. There are two key drivers of the operating loss that we're projecting. The first is the inflationary impact. Contract labor expenses, which include the impact of traveling and contracted nursing staff, have exceeded our budget by $3.8 million from a budget in FY22 of $200,000 to actuals now approaching $4 million on that line alone. Pharmacy and drug expenses are another area where we have seen expenses increase dramatically, and we're projecting a $930,000 overspend versus budget FY22. This is partly volume based, but also due to new drugs coming online, such as some of the specialty oncology drugs that have not yet transitioned onto the 340B program pricing. The second main area of, of impact is service access. As Dr. McGraw had mentioned, we partner with Dartmouth Health and Cheshire Medical Center on critical areas where we need to provide access to our patient base, but do not have our own providers. 
In expanding access to our community on these services, we have overspent on this line by $584,000. This next slide is a visual chart of our performance through year to date, May 22. As you can see, our first quarter was relatively strong with above the line operating gains reported. That was followed by a sharp decline in performance due to the surge in the Omicron variant, which led to BMH discontinuing all elective procedures for a period of time during the months of January and February. Since that low point, We've been working towards establishing positive operating margins while facing significant headwinds from inflationary pressures and service access concerns as outlined on the previous slide. One of the most significant pressures we are facing financially is our cash position and usage of reserves. This chart shows a significant decline in our cash reserve between the start of our fiscal year in October 21 through June 22. Our cash reserves declined by $3.7 million over this relatively short period of time due to the fact that we have needed to fund critical operational projects with cash. Our day's cash on hand have also significantly declined from 206 to 138 days over this period. Here's the breakdown of our requested fee increase. Overall, we are, project, we are requesting a 14.9% increase to gross charges, which breaks down as a 1% fee increase for the medical group, pharmacy and supplies, and a 20% increase for hospital areas. When translated to net patient, when translated to net patient revenue and fixed prospective payments, this fee increase nets down to a blended 13.3%. We modeled the fee increase request, which produces a modest $727,000 operating gain for the year and a 0.67% operating margin. It is worth noting that this operating margin we are proposing is very close to our proposal from last year which was a $669,000 operating gain and a 0.69% operating margin. As part of our budget request for FY23, we are planning for volume increases to particular segments of the hospital. We will see increased volumes in our inpatient services overall. We will also see increases in our hospital outpatient areas, specifically within pharmacy, OR and chargeable supplies. One area where we are anticipating decreased volumes is in births, and all other areas should remain relatively flat to the FY22 budget. Inflation will have a quantifiable effect on our FY23 budget and financial performance. In FY22, we put in place $2.2 million in wage increases at BMH, which will carry over and continue to be in effect for FY23. Given labor market <clears throat> pressures, we're planning to enact a similar sized additive wage increase in FY23, estimated at $1.6 million. We're working to reduce our reliance on contract temp labor and have budgeted a reduction in that line from actuals at $4 million in FY22 to $3 million for FY23. We expect to still need a significant investment in this area given the continuing labor pressures. Contract medical specialists will be up by $52,000 for FY23. We've estimated our fuel increase and exposure at $700,000 for FY23. And the healthcare provider tax rate, which on a rate basis has remained at 6% for BMH, uh, but with our volume increase, our tax bill will actually increase on a dollar basis by $860,000. So the total inflationary impact has been estimated at 8.2 million for the year. This next slide is a year over year income statement. I'd like to draw your attention to a few key lines. 
first, as mentioned on the previous slide, the wages will increase budget to budget by $2.2 million. Contract temps will increase budget to budget by $2.8 million. Drugs and other supplies, which are volume driven expenses, will increase our expenses by uh, $3 million when, when they're combined year over year. And the healthcare provider tax burden will increase by $860,000. This next slide is the budget balance sheet. I'd like to focus on a few critical lines here. First, we're expecting a cash decline of 18.7% or $1.2 million year over year. Total board designated assets is decreasing from 38 million to $32 million year over year, due in part to negative performance in our overall investment portfolio. But this decline can also be attributed to the fact that we have had to pull $3 million for the continued Ron Reed Pavilion project the $32 million is also a conservative estimate for FY23, as we have since had to pull an additional $2 million out of short-term investments in the month of July to fund critical operating expenses. The land, buildings, and improvements and major movable equipment lines have increased due to the CON construction project and build. As for the capital budget, over the past several years in our capital budgeting process, we've endeavored to keep our non-CON capital spend within a band of about 2.5 to $3 million. This year we're proposing $3 million for critical projects. Our spend will fall within the following categories, patient care equipment replacements, diagnostic department equipment, plant services, and IS projects and infrastructure upgrades. The CON project to construct the Ron Reed Pavilion is progressing well, we're happy to report. We have completed phase one of the project, which is the boiler plant upgrade. We expect to occupy the new building in mid-September, which will mark the completion of phase two. At that point, the renovation phase of the project or the third phase on the existing space will begin. Given our unsustainable current financial state and the continued pressures we experience as a hospital, we have committed to a series of savings initiatives to begin now in fiscal 22 and to continue throughout fiscal 23. We are enacting a series of enhancements and optimizations to our revenue cycle procedures that will improve our AR and net patient revenue. We've targeted certain areas of non-essential spend that we can reduce or eliminate. We've met and decided on certain capital projects to eliminate or carry over from FY22. We're enacting plans for position control and organizational design with a focus on productivity goals and staffing optimization. We're also conducting a review and rationalization of all existing contracts to determine whether they are necessary, discontinuing any unnecessary spend. We have begun to put these savings initiatives into action already at this point in FY22, and will continue the rollout of our action plans into FY23. I'm going to hand it over to Jody. Good afternoon. I'm Jody Stack, Chief Operating Officer, Chief Hello. Nursing Officer. So, when we presented in um, 2021, we were just starting to feel the impacts of what's being called the big quit or the great resignation. Um, this is a national trend, not limited to healthcare, but we're certainly feeling the impacts here in healthcare. COVID 19 is being framed as a life quake experience, and this is twofold for healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are caring for patients um, at hospitals and ambulatory care settings. And they're also dealing with COVID at home with family members, children who are displaced from childcare and the same social isolation that um, others are feeling. There's also generational differences and lack of pipelines that contribute to workforce challenges. All of this um, started to trickle in the spring and summer of 2021 
After a year of having no contract temps for nursing, we brought back contract temps in July of 2021. That trickle started to create um, a staffing problem that was compounded with hospital capacity issues. So hospitals in the region were surging with COVID and non-COVID patients. Beds are being closed or taken offline, largely due to the nursing shortage. We found ourselves in a position where we are unable to transfer patients to higher acuity, so both for medical and psychiatric care, and for lower acuity, so patients who had been admitted inpatient that need to go home with health services or to a skilled facility. Once you find a bed in either a higher or lower acuity setting, transportation becomes a, a challenge, specifically with critical care. And we have our inpatient beds full and boarding in the emergency department. So that staffing challenge that started as a trickle after a year of um, making some huge strides, combined with the capacity being limited, combined with multiple surges and bumps in COVID created some really adverse conditions for our staff. Um, this led to rapid turnover. So the numbers that you see below are a quick snapshot. We have almost 700 employees. You see a slow growth rate over the past year. This is from October 1st, um, 2021, with a turnover rate cumulative of 22.3%. If you look at this turnover rate, it has slowed in the last couple months. We've implemented a lot of things. Um, we continue to push forward with some of our initiatives but we're still feeling the impacts um, from 2021 and this high turnover. And as you've heard, um, and as you're aware, the cost of turnover is really high. The next slide, Laura, if you want to flip through, is one indicator of that. So what you're looking at is our contract labor spend year over year. If you look at fiscal year 2019, that 1.7 million was our biggest budget expense item at that time. We put a lot of things in place to decrease that spend, um, so investing in our own employees. We created the nurse residency program. The blue is RN um, contract temps and the orange is other allied health. So lab techs, respiratory therapists, um, echo techs. You could see the results of those initiatives in FY20 where we had a spend of 891,000. And when we came to you last year, um, we had been a whole year without contract temps. We projected the 242,000, and that was in the last quarter of 2021. So July to September was the 242,000. We were starting to feel the impacts. Um, we had staff going from regular positions to per diem, uh, reducing their hours significantly, and it really started to spiral. This year, we're projecting $4.1 million. We have um, anywhere from 16 to 20 contract temps on site at any given time, which is not much more than we had in FY19. The biggest difference is the bill rate. We're more than double the cost for those contract temps in specialty area. And we're seeing a bigger increase in um, allied health professionals, um, not just nursing. Next slide. And these are some of the things uh, that we're using as solutions. And these are things that we've done before and we know will have an impact. So compensation, we're committed to maintaining internal and external equity. We don't want people to have to leave their community to get a fair wage. We're nurturing our clinical collaborations and pipelines. So throughout the pandemic, we were committed to letting students on our facility um, and safely supporting them, knowing that that's our future. So that's both for nursing, allied health, an MA program. We've doubled the size of our nurse residency program through the pandemic, environmental services, and ongoing education and professional development opportunities for our leadership and all of our staff. Below, you'll see some of the schools or clinical collaborations that we have from high school to um, Keene State College, Vermont Tech, CCB, and Greenfield Community College. One of the big impacts is going to come from the culture that we create and maintain here at BMH. That includes trauma-informed, consistent leadership. There's been a lot of change in the past couple of years and stability is important. Um, trauma-informed, recognizing what our community has been through and what our staff has been through. Frequent transparent communication, Taking action against incivility and violence um, is a big one. Our staff need to feel supported 
um, and heard and kept safe, as you hear, heard Chris say earlier. People need flexibility as they um, to thrive in spite of the, the COVID-19 life quake recognition, evaluating staffing models, exit and stay interviews, and employee engagement surveys are going to look different and they're important. We need to ask people as they're leaving what it would take for them to re-enter healthcare because a lot of the people that we see leaving um, are leaving to go to another hospital. They're leaving the profession. Support for wellness programs that include mental health, and we need to create a diverse, equitable, and inclusive work environment for everybody. Again, I'm Chris Darty, President and CEO, and I'd like to just highlight a few of the risks. You can see what's on the screen, but let me highlight some of the high-risk areas that we have uh, in terms of trying to um, actually obtain this very razor-thin operational gain next year. Uh, one big risk for us is the status of Medicare-dependent hospitals and low-volume uh, uh, designated institutions. We are the only one in the entire state of Vermont uh, that is set to sunset September 30th of this year. Uh, we're very hopeful that a new U.S. bill uh, that is in the House and Senate right now will be approved, and that will actually make the Medicare-dependent hospitals and low-volume status a permanent designation. Uh, we're working very actively and arduously with a lobbying firm uh, to try and push that forward at this point in time. Um, we may have done this incorrectly, but we did not budget for a resurgence of COVID-19. We have no idea what the future holds uh, as much as we think of Dr. McGraw's incredible clinical expertise. I don't think she could predict what COVID-19 is going to look like this fall, this winter, or whenever. So we did not budget anything if there is a resurgence. So that's risky that there could be a resurgence and could send us into some difficult situations if we again have to stop doing elective procedures and other issues that we may have to contend with. We did in our budget put in uh, for the ongoing expenses of dealing with COVID, additional PPE, We've had to hire additional personnel for screening and other types of activities at our entrances. Those expenses are carried over from year to year at this point in time. But if there is a resurgence, we have a vulnerability and a risk there as well. Again, I may have made a big mistake by not budgeting something there, but we didn't. And then again, I'll say what was happening here this morning. Jody and several members of our nursing leadership team have been involved in active union negotiations with our nursing staff. And again, that's certainly a risk depending on how those negotiations go. We've only budgeted a very razor thin margin and uh, we're hopeful that these negotiations will go favorably and well for all parties and that that won't be uh, jeopardized this razor thin margin. Next slide, please, Laura. But there are great opportunities as well, and we look forward to a very exciting future after we get stabilized. We do see um, opportunities in continued revenue cycle improvements, as Laura mentioned, and we're looking at those aggressively and trying to find different ways to really optimize every um, dime owed to us by the insurance companies. Um, we will be continuing our collaboration with Dartmouth Health and Cheshire Medical Center uh, as Dr. McGraw said, we have a very strong strategic partnership with them. Uh, that is the only way this area would have access to the types of subspecialty care that we've been able to bring only through Dartmouth Health. And we'll continue to work with them on trying to bring additional subspecialties. We have a joint operating agreement with them, and we've been talking with them about other subspecialties that on a rotational basis may provide better care to this community. And as Jody mentioned, we really are uh, rekindling our, our efforts in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, I am not a Star Wars fan, but that comes out to Jedi. So we are on a Jedi journey to actually really infuse into our culture, into everything we do, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, we're working with some tremendous community leaders in that regard 
we look forward to learning from some of our colleagues. Uh, we've been reaching out to Dartmouth Health uh, that has a tremendous uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion program. And also the University of Vermont Medical Center has a wonderful one. And we're looking at best practices from across the country and trying to get those incorporated here so that we can be more just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive. And then finally, we're also excited about pursuing such population health management activities as creating a mobile health integrated network. Our uh, local EMS team uh, is actually getting uh, a, a very large grant. They received a very large grant to create a program here in the Brattleboro area. And we started to talk to them about how uh, community paramedics may be able to help us with chronically ill patients and to more proactively manage the ongoing health of patients who we know have a chronicity that needs to be dealt with. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, again, we uh, do come before you asking for a large rate increase comparatively to anything we've done in the past. Uh, it's, it's not our desire to do that, but it is the only way we see of trying to create a stable future and to, to really generate a very razor thin operating margin of 0.67% and about $727,000. Um, so we, we ask for that approval and, or you can go to the next slide, please. And we really don't fear the future. We know we just need to get strong right now and we need to be able to tackle the future in a very positive, strong way and create an ideal future. Uh, we truly applaud you all for the vitally important charge that you all have undertaken and accepted to reduce the rate of healthcare costs in Vermont while ensuring that the state of Vermont maintains a high quality, accessible healthcare system. We stand here today to partner with you in that noble mission that you have accepted. We have done all that we can to keep our uh, request for a rate incre increase as low as possible. We implore you to approve uh, the, these rates so that we can stop the degradation of the quality of care, service levels de degradation, and also degradation to access to essential health services for our beloved community. We ask you to approve our budget and to allow us to go on the road to becoming the hub of hope, health, and healing for our entire community. We thank you for your time and attention, and we look forward to your questions, guidance, and uh, opportunities to partner together. Nate, hey, thank you so much um, for the presentation. It's nice to see you all and to meet some new faces. Um, and I recognize that for some of you coming before the Green Mountain Care Board is a new experience and uh, we appreciate your efforts in, in preparing the materials for this unique process that we have here in Vermont. Uh, with that, wow, and we are, and thank you also for your timeliness. We are actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so appreciate that. Um, I will open it up to questions from the board again, starting with Robin. Great, thank you. Um, and nice to meet all of you from Brattleboro. Um, I grew up in Brattleboro, so I always look forward to hearing about uh, your budget and how things are going. Um, so my first question is, I just want to walk through some of the appendix tables. Um, so we use the appendix tables typically um, to kind of understand some of the assumptions that are outlined in the budget. And some of your appendix tables were not fully um, filled out. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. And I understand you're new and this is a new process, so I'm sure it's challenging. Um, but I wanted, to, so in appendix one, which is the reconciliation tables, it looks to me um, in looking over your budget generally that the, you're asking for essentially a 10 million increase in NPR from projected to next year's budget. And of that, about 8 million is from the price increase. Am I, am I understanding that correctly from the materials? And I can't see you by the way, so I'm sorry. If, <laughs> not, I'm not sure if you have your camera on, but. I think we have the camera on. 
it's just not. Do you have the video on? Oh, oh. No, I don't know. And that's okay. No worries. <laughs> Here we come. Sorry. Oh, great. Sorry no, about no, that. No problems. <laughs> it's just nice to, to see you when I'm asking questions. <laughs> Hi, Robin. This is Andre Bissonnette. The Hi, Andre. Outgoing. Good to good to see you. Good to see you guys. Outgoing CFO. So we're kind of tag teaming this. Um, I don't have the appendix in front of me, but that's pretty close. Um, I think to the numbers that I recall, uh, majority of it is in the fee increase. Okay. So could we talk a little bit about the utilization assumption? So um, appendix three. Um, wasn't completed and so I usually use that to and compare it to um, the information from adaptive which also quite frankly looks wonky um, it it has like your total average daily census as one which I'm sure is an error um, so could we just talk a little bit about the utilization assumptions it sounds like um, you're assuming sort of, I think your narrative said January year to date is what you were using. Is that right? That's what we built the budget with. Yeah, it was January year to date. And then as we got closer to submission, as Laura talked about earlier, um, the those volumes have definitely changed since January. And um, but that's not reflected in the budget assumptions at this point, right? Uh, no, not 100%. We reflected uh, January year to date with, um, you know, some, some, some decrease because we knew what um, February and what March was potentially going to look like, but we weren't to a point with um, April and June to lock those into a budget assumption. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly understanding it sounds like the Omicron surge in earlier this year really hit the hospital hard and um, you had to shut down uh, services. But setting that particular piece aside for a moment, can you speak a little bit to where you think you are compared to 2019 in terms of utilization? And the reason I ask is that in the data that we saw during the rate review process, we saw a it looked like there's a pretty good correlation between COVID surges and ED utilization, meaning the opposite ED fell and urgent care fell when COVID came up. But at least statewide, um, there was the there might be some delays, but the care was catching up within the same year. So I'm just wondering if uh, that's a trend you've seen, if you for some reason are not kind of consistent with that state statewide trend, and if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think the it is it has some correlation with the statewide trend. I know when we um, reduced some services because of the second round in January and February, the ER really wasn't much less busy um, during the first round of COVID. It definitely dropped. Um, uh -huh. You know, you know, with us and I think all the other hospitals. We were trying to get patients not to come into the ER if possible, um, sure. you know, for just for all around safety reasons. When the second time came around, none of that was out there. So we really didn't see that much of a change in the ER volumes. Where we did see volume issues were in our ORs because we had to reduce the OR down. We had almost 60, F 60 staff out on mm -hmm. what I call COVID protocol. Uh, and wow. some of those, yeah, we just could not staff the OR. Um, some of the clinics were the same way. Uh, so those are two of the areas that we saw the decrease. We've seen those bounce back since February. Yep. Um, and our inpatient has actually been really busy all through this. So those are the areas kind of what um, Laura highlighted with the areas that we saw some volume increases from budget to budget. Compared to 19, um, I didn't go back and compare it to 19, but they probably are a little bit, those areas are a little higher than what 19 was. Okay, great, thank you. And the um, other, area, the other area, area, Robin, that we've, we've yeah. seen a really, two, two areas uh, of a big increase. One is our orthopedic surgery uh, area with um, our total joint program. We've seen uh, 
a significant increase in that. So if you look at our supply line, that's you see that going up. That's part of the chargeable supplies. And the other area is in our drugs, which is our infusion program. Uh -huh. um, two things have happened there. One, we've seen some pretty significant volume increases there, unfortunately. Uh, and two, as Laura stated, um, some of the drugs that we're doing, if they're new drugs, they don't qualify for 340B until we use them. So we got to pay full boat up front for them. And the third leg of that is big pharma reducing, you know, what or increasing what some of those costs are. Sure. Okay. And are you, do you think the ortho will, has flattened out or do you think it might continue to grow in uh, next year? Um, I think it's going to grow. Um, I think, you know, probably in a, a, a two to 5% range. Um, we've got a new orthopedic surgeon starting in September, right? September. And, um, and we have the Greenfield market, Greenfield, Massachusetts, as, as was on one of the slides, where they do not have an ortho presence. So we've targeted our growth really in that Greenfield market in Massachusetts. Makes sense. Um, great. So turning to the court report, oh. and uh, the last person that oh. answered, uh, can Sorry. I get your name, please? Sorry, that was Chris Darty. Sorry about that. Thank you. You bet. I'm, I'm just taking a quick look at my notes. Um, that may be all I have, but let me just check one more tab. Oh, um, in terms of your savings initiatives, um, I know in your in your narrative, you I think if I'm remembering correctly, and please let me know if I'm not, um, that these were fairly new initiatives that you had started in 22. So so at the time, of course, that you submitted your budget, you weren't necessarily able to reflect those savings estimates in your budget. Do I remember that right? Yeah, that's correct, Rob. Um, do you have estimates of what you're targeting for fiscal year 23? Not yet, Robin. We are, I'm sorry, this is Chris Stardy again. Um, we are working on that as we speak of trying to come up with those estimates. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm all set for now, Jess. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Robin. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to board member Tom Pelham. Well, good afternoon. Um, you do have a very typical task ahead of you, and uh, we all hope for your success. And if you are a success, you'll look back on this period as something to be very proud of. But clearly, there's some di difficult decision making that um, you know is before you and f and before us. Um, but uh, we wish you the best of luck. I want to shadow um, Robin a little bit um, on a different table. I was looking at the the payer mix tables and uh, just to kind of see by re uh, revenue category what was growing relative to what. And I noticed uh, that for two columns, the uh, commercial uh, revenues were growing at 39%. And then I noticed that, that for um, 22B and 22P, uh, they were identical. So there, um, you know, there's some noise there and uh, so rather than use those, and you know, the result of that noise is that on the income statement, you profile um, NPR at $105 million. And on the payer mix table, it profiles at $111 million. So there's there's some noise there that uh, I think needs to be um, needs to be fixed. Um, so to get another view of the uh, relative growth, um, uh, 22, 23, uh, 23 budget over uh, 22 budget. I went to the the same table that Robin uh, just mentioned a minute ago, the reconciliation table, and there uh, you can see that there's a big increase um, in commercial of 47 percent uh, year over year. And as Robin, uh, you know, kind of noticed or, or questioned, uh, 6.7 of that eight plus uh you know of of, of that increase is um 
uh, from, from, from the rate. But I also noticed that the Medicare amount went from 37.2 million down to 33 million for an 11% reduction. And the Medicaid amount went from 13 million down to, let's see, 9.8 million for a 25% cut. And so my question on this is, why why that those large reductions in Medicare and Medicaid? Well, <clears throat> you're looking at budget to budget, Tom, I think, and um, without actually seeing it in front of me, the there's been a, a change in how we were looking at some of this. Um, if you remember, Mike Rogers um, used to do all of this work and then Foxborough, and I'm not exactly sure how he had some of that stuff mapped. Um, what I pulled out was actually what's in our general ledger. So that's what I'm relying on. And I, I couldn't go back to 2022 budget into his files. Um, he used um, an extensive Excel setup as well as um, a program you, you may have heard of, uh, Fox Pro, to run these numbers. And I don't have the mapping that he had in Fox Pro because I do not know how to use it. Um, so I think that may be a, a large part of the difference. So okay. the number. The numbers that I used were based off of what is actually in our general ledger. That I that I know how to go back to and baseline. So so in, in the adaptive material that we have, what what is the best that we should use uh, to understand any payer mix changes? Twenty two um, proposed budget over twenty two approved. In adaptive. Yes. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at that, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Um, my next one had to do with the provider tax. And um, I, I asked this question because I thought I might see something that could be a benefit to you, but I don't know. Um, if uh, so, you're, you're booking the provider tax increase for. Um, for uh, uh, 22, 23 over 22 at 15.5 percent. That's a a one million dollar a one million dollar uh, increase, a little over a million dollars. Um, and so if you uh, if you take the 2022, and I, and I know that there's a number of ways that people calculate this tax. So I'm just probing to see to to better understand what you did. Um, if you take the uh, the uh, prior year um, NPR amount and multiply that by um, 6%, which is uh, the, the size of the tax, you come up with uh, like, like $5.55 million, some significantly yeah. less than what you have budgeted. And so my question here is, what is the methodology that, that, you, and that you used? And it could be the correct methodology. There's a lot of noise in this calculation. What is the methodology that you used to calculate the increase uh, that resulted in the 15%, 15.5% increase? Uh, I took the, I just basically took the budgeted net patient revenue plus the FPP and multiplied it by 6%. Okay. Well, you, um, you might want to go back and check that calculation. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I get a number that's, uh, that's lower than yours, uh, kind of using that same logic. But um, you, include, I, I, you include the dish revenue in there and and um, bad debt and charity in the net revenue. Net revenue. Say that again. Do you include the dish revenue in there and charity um, care, charity care and bad debt? Well, I'm I'm working I'm working off the numbers on the income the income okay. statement, and so they do have that. Okay. So. Just, just to double check, yeah, because um, I think if it breaks differently, it'll, re it'll break to your favor. Um, looking at looking at travelers, um, how much? I mean, you so on page twelve of the narrative, there's a statement about the sixteen FTE uh, nurse al um, allied health travelers. Um, how much have you budgeted for these sixteen FTEs in 2023? It's three million dollars, two point eight million. Yeah. Two point eight, and and Tom, what we did was, we have vacancies, and this 
probably may go down the wrong way, but we, we don't want to make, we want to make sure we don't budget an FTE, a full FTE that that traveler would be taking the place of because it's vacant at a 1.0 and a 1.0 traveler. So what we do is we budget the FTE and then we back down the traveler a little bit to offset it. So we're not double budgeting. So basically we were looking, it was either 14 or 16 FTEs when we built the budget and we figured that that was going to run through the majority of next year, if not the whole year. Mm -hmm. Just because we, we don't see any signs of um, that labor market um, mm -hmm. breaking or, or, or softening at all. Well, my, 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 me, this me, is, pardon me, court report. And the last person that spoke, your name, please. Andre Bissonnette. Okay. okay, thank you. I mean, my interest in that is just uh, kind of an emerging interest, kind of looking at uh, hopefully uh, 24 and 25 you know, if things start to break kind of back to normal. And so um, for some hospitals having built their 23, 22 and 23 budgets on a lot of um, uh, travelers that that uh, all that money might not be needed down the road. And so the thought is, you know, does that money just go to other expenditures within a hospital or uh, does it go uh, to fund balance, or does it go somehow back to uh, ratepayers? So I'm just, I'm just, you know, it's I'm just curious about, you know, how much, uh, ba how much we're building, and uh, you know, in travelers that at some time may be freed up to do something else with. Um, That's a great question. This is Chris Starty, and we're aggressively going after the expenses of the travelers and trying to wean ourselves off the travelers in 2023. Our hope is, is that when we get to fiscal year 2024, we will virtually be completely off. And Jody, our chief operating officer, chief nursing officer, has a whole host of programs, including nursing residency programs, to start infusing more nurses that we'll hire and start to pull ourselves away. We see 2023, honestly, as a transitional year. Um, again, increasing the wages. We've gone through a lot in 2022. We'll continue to do so in 2023 to try and keep pulling ourselves away from needing the um, travelers. Right now, it's just that there's such a high number of vacancies that we've had to deploy them. But our hope is by 2024, we'll be completely off of the traveler need. Let's hope. Um, the uh, next, my next question uh, has to do with free care. And I just noticed, uh, I mean, we can't call it a pattern because there's only four or five data points, but I noticed that um, for free care, the actual amount on the income statement was uh, basically a cost or a deduction from revenues of $778,000. And then the budget amount for 22B budget was $2.8 million. And then, but the pro projected now for 2022 uh, projected is back down at the 2021 actual level of 755, 756 million dollars, um, and that but the 23 budgeted amount goes back up to 3.8 million dollars. So I'm just wondering about the rhythm of that, where where the budgeted amounts seem to be, and uh, it's not conclusive, but seem to be higher than what actually occurs. Yeah, and if you look at the bad debt, it's gone the opposite direction of the, the charity. And one of the things that we need to, to work on is getting those patients to come back in to complete the applications. And we saw that during that first phase of COVID where we weren't able to process those applications for the free care. We know it's happening. Um, I, I, a lot of times from a financial standpoint, look at it as a complete bucket as opposed to an individual bucket between bad debt and charity care, because if it's not going to fall to charity care, it's going to end up in bad debt. And our goal is to move it from bad debt to charity care. Um, so we need to do a, a better job at being able to get those patients in and, and probably marketing that we, we're here for them and it's fine to come in and talk to us. Um, I, I think there's probably still a little bit of 
fear out there with patients coming in and talking to our financial counselors, um, more from a, a COVID fear than anything else. And let's see, let's see. Um, I'm going to try to get your pictures back up. I've been looking at spreadsheets while I'm talking to you. It's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the numbers are sitting there chattering away. Um, the, so um, I'm looking at total operating expenses and uh, your um, budget to budget um, amount is a 12% increase. And um, that is kind of uh, right near the same place that the entire population of hospitals is at for uh, their 2023 request. Um, and the entire population is at 12.6%. Um, but I'm wondering, um, just hypothetically, if, uh, if things turn out that um, there is a 2% reduction in your operating expenses or there's some kind of pressure for a 2% reduction in your operating expenses. That would take your um, uh, <clears throat> total oper your total operating amount down from the 100 $108 million uh, down to 106, still a 9.8% increase over your uh, 20, 20, hang on a second. Let me just get you up here so I'm making sure I'm talking to the right thing here over your uh, 2022 20, 20, budget. So um, just hypothetically, um, if that were your world um, and you can bring it home and get have the kind of success and sustainability, you know, that you're hoping for, um, but it would cost you uh, 2 percent on uh, your operating expenses. Do you have a, a, a list of backup or, or of ideas that you would uh, employ to get yourself to that stabilization point? Well, uh, this is Chris Stardy again. We are constantly looking at ways of both enhancing revenue as well as reducing expenses. We're developing that list. I think Laura shared some of that uh, opportunity, uh, but we're looking at a whole host of different things, including, you know, we have some vacancies in our revenue cycle management system. We're very interested in looking at digital workforce and other ways of reducing labor costs. These are just things that haven't come to fruition at this point in time. Our biggest concern is um, with the margin that we're running and just hopeful to have a positive margin next year. Uh, we just fear the degradation of services, uh, even the quality of the care that we're providing because uh, this, the capacity of our system keeps getting constrained um, and we're, we're very concerned about that, but we are looking at every opportunity for uh, reducing our operating expense. There's things, as Laura mentioned, even this year, we mm -hmm. uh, looked at ways of maintaining cash by not funding some of the capital that had been approved so that we would maintain our cash. We'll constantly do everything we can uh, to manage as effectively with the, the most prudent financial stewardship as possible. But at this point, we don't have really a list of all those things, except these are all things we're exploring. Well, I fully appreciate, given some of my history, that it's hand-to-hand -hand combat and the little things do it, the little little things do add up. Absolutely. You know, so um, um, I wish you the best of luck and uh, Thank you. We'll be deliberating sometime in the future about all this. Well, thank you. Uh, so with that, with that, I will pass it back to Jess. Great, thank you. And I, with that, I'm going to pass it over to the other Tom, Tom Walsh. <laughs> thank you, Jess. Um, hello, Chris. Hello, everyone um, in Brattleboro. It's nice it's to see you again, Chris, and and to meet it's, everybody. It's great to see you again, Tom. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, it's it's looking over the material that you sent us. It's obvious you're in a in a um, a very difficult spot, and you're all. Um, I guess I want to commend each of you for being willing to enter into it and to try to make a difference. Um, that it's you're new. I'm sure that you saw some of this when you signed up for it. It doesn't make it any easier. Um, but but thanks for doing what you're doing. 
I think the the uh, retention plan, the getting the the compensation and culture improvement, I think that's really the right place to be starting. Um, having a stable workforce um, makes all the other improvements and identifying savings and and improve improving systems and processes. It's the workforce that does that. So I think you're on the right track there. Um, the the um, I, I think too. Um, I just want to uh, give a word of caution about um, maybe being opti overly optimistic about volume increases as as the pandemic recedes, um, and with the the focus on uh, ortho um, with with the new surge and coming on. The, the reason that I feel some sense of caution about that is, is not only are, are you all in a difficult point, but the community is too. And the price increases that are rippling through the community, not just in healthcare, but everywhere, um, I think it's more emotionally and mentally, more emotional and mental strain on the people we serve. We see that in the ED story that you mentioned, Chris. I appreciate that story. Um, I think there's also the possibility that with higher prices and higher premiums out of pocket expenses, um, people may not be returning to healthcare as much as we anticipate, not because out of fear of COVID, but out of fear of debt. And, and so the balance that you're trying to have, having, uh, being paid enough to keep going and do these improvements, it's a it's a tough balance. But um, I haven't read yet of people modeling or thinking about a reduction in volume because the prices are too high. Um, but I think we need to be thinking about that. Um, this so the um, finally the the savings that you mentioned that the um, your staff is is looking to achieve or leadership is looking to achieve. I just recommend really engaging the staff, trying to trying to find every place that you can. As board member Pelham said, the little things add up. Um, and and we've heard of successes um, you know, across the country in different organizations of really engaging a staff to try to find a way through this and to, and to find more savings. Um, Particularly in the in the orthopedic line and joint replacement line, there's there's a bunch there for streamlining that service line, especially if you're developing a new one, um, with um, and negotiating with the the vendors for for uh, implants and supplies. So just keep looking under every rock. Um, and, and I don't have any questions. I just want to commend you for stepping into this. You're all very new, um, and it's a tough spot. Thank you, Tom, and, to and you, thank you, uh, Chair Holmes. Thank you for that comment about involving staff. They are the ones that know best at all times where the uh, trimming can come and where we can have a relentless war on waste. But it can't happen in the C-suite. It has to happen, uh, and I think. Um, board member Pelham said it so well. It's in the hand-to-hand -hand combat that's going on every minute of every day that we really need to be uh, focused on. Great. So I guess I'm the last one up, and some of my questions were actually already asked, which is helpful. Um, it's good to be last in this case. Uh, one of the questions I did want to ask was about the charge master, the rate increase of 14.9, call it 15. Um, we do know that charge master increases don't translate right into one for one increases in what the effective commercial rate that the average commercial payer will face because of different payer contracts. So I'm wondering if your team can, you know, help us understand what that historical relationship has been between the charge master and what I'll call the effective commercial rate for Brattleboro and thus what your best estimate of what that 15% increase in the charge master will translate into. Boy, I, I 
I'm not sure I could give you an accurate answer off the top of my head, Jessica, on that. Um, okay, you can follow up if you want. That's fair. I'd rather have it be accurate than a guess during a hearing. So we can just put yeah. that in. Perhaps you can share that estimate with uh, Sarah Lindbergh afterwards. We're trying to really understand how this is going to hit pocketbooks and recognizing that there's not a one for one relationship. Yeah, so, so you're saying if what you're looking for is if we're raising our overall rates by 15%, what is the average commercial payer going to be reimbursing us? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. That is, you know, discount off charges, the fixed like I know there's a combination of ways in which you have payer contracts. So and you know, some of the work that our um, Berkeley Research Group did really looked at the relationship between increases in the charge master and what actually materialized in in commercial rates. And, and it's nowhere close to a one for one relationship and it varies by hospital based on their contracts. So I'm trying to understand what does this really mean? OK, thank you. That would be helpful. Um, and I, I guess my second question then is, how are you going to apply whatever rate increase is given uh, or allowed um, to Brattleboro? How do you apply it across services? You know, we have heard from carriers that you know there's an average rate increase, but in some instances reimbursement rates are are higher. Some in reimbursement rates are lowered, and it may depend on what potential margin might be, what potential volume is, market competitiveness. How do you decide? where you're going to apply whatever rate increase is um, allowed. Yeah, this is Andre this and that. Um, the, the way that we're planning on doing it this year is, you know, we outlined the areas of service line type of areas. So all of our hospital based charges will get a 20% increase. The practice, all of the physician practice billings and in the charge master, well, and our supplies and our pharmaceuticals would be 1%. We haven't raised those in a long time. And some of the contracts have a, a greater or lesser of charge. So if, they're, if their fee schedule is greater than our charge, they'll pay our charge. So we want to try and make sure we're not leaving any of that on the table because we haven't adjusted those prices in a long period of time. I figured we'd take a shot at it with 1% and see if that actually moved the bar at all. Um, but overall, all the hospital charges would get a 20% a increase. I don't Straight know across that. the board. Yeah. Everything across the board. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that. That's helpful. So uh, there was some discussion in here about the strategic relationship that um, Brattleboro has with Dartmouth-Hitchcock. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Dartmouth's new patient pavilion, right? With its 65 brand new beds that are slated for completion, I think this fall with an opening scheduled for 23. And I think this is gonna be wonderful for patients. It's gonna increase capacity in our system in Vermont. Um, but one of my concerns is that particularly in hospitals that are say within an hour or so radius of Dartmouth-Hitchcock, um, that this is gonna, create more workforce pressures um, and certainly may you know impact uh, your ability to reduce your reliance on travelers if, if there's a you know uh, I think about it as like a giant sucking noise from coming from Dartmouth <laughs> where, you know people are lured by potentially higher wages by the opportunity to work in a brand new facility whatever the case might be um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that risk that you face and also you know to the degree that it may affect your daily census if there's now some more capacity not too far away um how does that impact your estimates of your average daily census going forward so i didn't see it as a risk listed good point, good point. so but i think it must be you no know? mm -hmm. yes good point we'll, we'll add that thank you jessica so this is jody stack i can speak to the workforce um, you know, we have uh, we have folks that travel now that uh, that could be at Dartmouth. I think that our our goal right now is to keep people who live here in this community working here, um, and I'm confident that that we're able to do that. You know, from 2019 into 20, even after the first surge, that's what people want. Um, so we don't necessarily, um, you know, have to compete that far out. We just not need to make it so there's not a compelling case to leave their community, um, if that makes sense. Um, and so we're, we're always looking at that kind of uh, 
equity, but we've done it before. And, you know, we're really looking at the folks who have reduced their hours in the past couple of years, um, who had need, needed a respite. They're still here in this community. And what can we do and what kind of environment do we need to create so that they will re-enter the workforce? Um, so I'm not saying it's not a risk, but it's not, it's not one I'm overly concerned about. Great job, Jody. This is Chris Starty. I'll, I'll answer the second part of that, Jessica, if I may, and that had to do with volume impact, potential volume impacts. Uh, you know, we know the lane that we swim in, and it's it's very much primary acute care. We, we, we don't try and swim in the secondary or tertiary care world. And so our relationship with Dartmouth Health has always been a mutually beneficial relationship the community feels so connected to Brattleboro Memorial Hospital to care for those primary health care needs. And that's where we see our strength. Uh, we don't believe that our uh, inpatient or outpatient volumes will be impacted adversely uh, due to this. And our growth is really in the outpatient world. So the shiny new inpatient tower uh, is not where we're looking to grow. It's actually what we're looking to move away from. Um, uh, we're seeing tremendous gains in endoscopy services and the things that we should be doing for this community and doing it as close to home as possible. So we would really push our efforts on those things that need to be done right here in Brattleboro and partner with our strategic partner in Dartmouth on those things that could uh, leave this community. But I don't see that as having a tremendous volume impact. I'll ask Dr. McGraw to see if she feels differently yeah, or this, not. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Kat McGraw. The thing that I would add is that we track our transfers and we know that our transfers go to Dartmouth, but we also know they go substantially to Bay State uh, down in, in Massachusetts That's and other point. places in Massachusetts as well. Um, the distances that our transfers have had to go has been quite tremendous at times. And so I think that the additional beds at Dartmouth would be extremely helpful in, uh, with re relationship to that. Um, I think we have found in our relationship with Dartmouth that they are very um, willing to be helpful to us to keep the patients that belong here, here, and provide assistance as necessary, whether through telesolutions or even just over um, phone consults, because they do want to have their beds open for the most ill patients because those are the ones that really belong there, that fits their educational uh, goals as well. Um, and uh, so I think I, I think that there's not as much risk as it would appear at face value. Okay, great. I mean, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I would just add related to that, there was a, a part of the budget guidance that asked for occupancy rates for both licensed and staffed beds, as well as uh, historical average daily census data. And I didn't see it in the narrative um, submission. So I'm wondering also as a follow up, whether that could be supplied to Sarah and our team as well. Just I, unless I missed it, I didn't um, I didn't see that section. It was under the utilization. I, I don't believe it was in it was in there. Or, no, but we'll work on that, Jessica, and we'll work with Sarah. And I must say, Sarah, uh, we want to give a shout out to Sarah. We're all new here. Uh, we went through a transition with Andre moving on to another site and Laura jumping in as we awaited a new CFO. And from what I've heard, Sarah has been incredibly helpful in this process and helping us learn. Uh, what we need to do for our submission. So we'd like to give a shout out. I don't know if she's on the call, but uh, if you could give her a shout out. Okay, thank you. She's and on the Jessica, call. She's on. very well deserved. Oh, thank you. Thanks. And, and Thanks. Jessica, this is Andre Bissnett. Um, yeah, going back to the transition that we had from, you know, when Mike Rogers was here from Foxborough, all of the stats ran through Foxborough. We had to actually build all of the stats in our new accounting system now. And I think we can add those stats to it going forward. So we didn't, we weren't able to rebuild everything. I, this, this really started happening from November, end of no, actually first of December to now, and being able to get all the stats that we were actually able to get and get through the budget process and season with rebuilding everything. Um, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job, but obviously we missed a few things. Yeah, no, and that's okay. And trust Martin me. And think... Core report and um, last speaker, please. Andre Bissnett. 
I was just going to say, Andre, that I totally can appreciate transitions and being placed in positions. <laughs> in, in the so, you have my sympathy, empathy, and all else. Um, if I can just add just one more request, and I, I suspect, and I fully understand this will be for next year. Um, but Dr. McGraw, you and I had chatted so much about wait times and all of that, and I think it would be really helpful next year to have the, you know, the referral lags and visit lags as best we can broken out by practice area. We're trying to understand, you know, where some of the specialty bottlenecks are in the system, and I think what was submitted this year was just medical group as an entirety. It doesn't help us really understand, you know, is it cardiology, is it neurology, is it dermatology, or is it just in this region that it's dermatology, or is it across the state? So, you know, I recognize the, the the restraints, the constraints that you're under this year with transitions and new data systems. But hope putting a plug in for next year in the hopes that we can work on that and have a better understanding of just, you know, access issues throughout the whole system. So, just just a a, a parking lot for that. Delighted to. We are. This is Chris Tardy. We are extremely concerned about access, uh, basically quality of care. And ultimately, the long-term reduction of cost is all predicated on good access to care when needed, where needed. And uh, so, yes, we will certainly commit to that. Perfect. Thank you. And my last request is also just a follow-up request um, that I'm asking all the hospitals to do. But since the budget submission, if there's been any known or likely changes to any federal or state payments, relief funds, you know, grants or unexpected increases in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates um, to just follow up with our team just so that we can understand because there are some things out there at play and we would like to make sure that we have full information um, as we go into the budget deliberations. And to the degree that there's also, you know, somebody mentioned this morning um, with Southwestern, if there's big swings on the cost side, that's also something that we need to know. So to be fair on both ends, pluses and minuses, if there's just big substantive, I would say material changes, um, in any of those categories. It would be helpful if you could share that with Sarah. You so, bet. You thank bet. you. Thank you. Uh, I think that is it from all board members. Are there any other board members that have just a follow-up question, burning question? I'm seeing shaking of heads, no. Okay. Um, why don't I kick it over to Sarah, Lindbergh, and Russ if there's any staff questions before we move on to the HCA? Yeah, hi, uh, this is uh, Sarah Lindbergh. I head the finance team here at the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I want to thank you for presenting today and also say that, uh, you know, in retrospect, I wish we would have been a little more helpful along the way as we were all going through this transition. So um, thanks for um, being responsive and, and helping us work through any kind of missing material. Uh, I did want to say that we're just kind of digesting now that we have all the actuals in through Q3 to try and see what that might be doing uh, for projections uh, at the end of 22. Looks like you've already done some of that work in this presentation. So I just wanted to um, say, Laura, we'll probably be putting our heads together to make sure I've, I've got that correct. Uh, and that uh, my question, though, is... Uh, if you're seeing kind of any stabilization, uh, particularly in the expense cycle at this point, or if it's still pretty uh, mercurial. We are, we are, um, I would say, seeing the beginnings of stabilization in our expenses. Um, is it still, to use your, your words, so mercurial, um, but we have seen, you know, we're we're hoping that the contract temp line will um, smooth out. We did have some hits early on in the year in the, our benefits uh, line due to some some of our employees hitting a stop loss threshold, which has since um, smoothed out. Um, we we were seeing a lot of um, expense increases in the medical surgical supplies, which is also volume driven um, and somewhat reimbursable for us. Um, we saw some of that come down in, in the last couple of months. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the, the last quarter um, and hoping that we will come closer to um, a, a positive outcome. Uh, excuse me, court report. Last speaker name, please. 
This is Laura for now. Thank you. And, and this is Chris starting just to add to that, Sarah, as well. Uh, a lot of the uh, things that we're challenging uh, ourselves with in terms of expense reductions will also start to take some shape here in this last quarter as well. They won't come to full fruition, but I believe that we will see a stabilization in our operating expense in this last quarter. And thank you again, Sarah, face to face. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. I think that was it from the team. I just pulled us all. So um, that should cover us for now. Thank you very much. OK, you know what? We have um, the HCA questions and then a possibility for public comment. Um, do we want to take a 10 minute Bio break recess, would that be helpful to the Brattleboro Memorial team? I'm seeing some shaking in a pen. So why don't we <laughs> ahead of schedule? Uh, see, I have lots of empathy and sympathy today. Um, <laughs> why don't we come back? It's three o'clock. We'll come back at 310. OK, Sam, I see you on. Are you kicking off uh, HCA questions or will Mike be doing that? Uh, it'll be me and Charlie Becker is also on from the HCA. He's going to ask any questions that I missed or follow up on anything that I that I missed. OK, great. Take it awesome. away. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, and so Sam Pyche, for the record, Sam Pyche, Health Policy Analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, also the HC, also known as the HCA. Um, thank you, Brattleboro, for being here. And thanks for your submission. Uh, a couple of the questions we have, a lot of them are really follow up based on your narrative. And um, some of the questions that we had have been asked by the board. So thank you for those. Our first question is, Please describe your plan to come into compliance with the provisions of Act 119. I think you know this, but this is a reminder. This is the PFA, Patient Financial Assistance and Medical Debt Protection Bill that was passed last legislative session. And just wanted to say in your submission, you said there weren't any obstacles and you haven't revised your policy yet. And I know there are two years um, to still do that, but I'm just wondering if there are any obstacles to that and when you plan to review your changes in policy. Sure. If I may, if I may start, uh, this is Chris Darty and Sam. It's nice to meet you. And um, why we said that we didn't perceive any obstacles is our current uh, financial assistance program is actually very robust, and there are some uh, sort of uh, maximum points or, 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 or endpoints that we actually need to increase. For example, our 75% charity discount only goes up to 350% of the federal po poverty level, so we would have to increase that to 400%. We are starting to actually piece through that and make sure that we'll be ready for compliance, certainly by July 1st, 2024, but I, I believe well before that time as well, Sam. I, I'm going to ask if Andre or Laura have anything to add from a finance perspective. I, I don't want to overstep uh, my bounds, but I do not see any issues of coming into compliance with that. No, and, and Sam, this is Andre this and that. Um, yeah, the other thing is we usually, when we have changes like this, we've also engaged um, other entities, like we have a compliance group through the BOS uh, group, uh, hospital association, um, attorneys, and our, our um, tax accounts to make sure we're consistent and in compliance um, and, and, and making sure we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, it's great to meet you both too, at least virtually. Um, <laughs> and uh, so our next question is related to affordability and access, probably no surprise. Um, Given that we know from the recent Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey, there are a lot of folks in Vermont, 47%, that are either underinsured or uninsured commercially. And so I'm wondering if how your institution, if at all, calculates some sort of inflection point or assesses affordability and then uses that to inform its charge request for next year. Uh, well, I'll start again. Uh, this is Chris Starty once again, Sam, and uh, very important question. And I, 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 I think right now what we're looking to do is reinstitute our Patient Family Advisory Council and working with patients and families, talking about affordability, talking about the out-of-pocket costs, coming up with plans. Again, I think we're kind of in a good situation because of our very generous financial assistance program at this point in time. But this is something that always constantly needs to be evaluated. And I believe working with our community, our Patient Family Advisory Council is going to be a big way for us to, to really um, uh, to, to, to make sure that we're constantly keeping our 
uh, and affordability across all spectrums of our uh, community. Uh, we do have a wonderful patient family experience officer that works with patients and families if there are any concerns and we get those resolved quickly and immediately. But we do need to have a proactive approach and I believe with the Patient Family Advisory Council we can do that. I don't know if uh, Andre or Dr. McGraw or anybody wants to add anything to that. No, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Just as a follow up, um, as far as that council, it sounds like it existed previously. I'm wondering if there's community represent or patient representation on that council, or there would be. Oh, yes, sir. Actually, it would be made up virtually of all patients and family members. Um, it, it, COVID had challenged that as it did everything else. Just bringing people together has been challenging, but we're going to reinvigorate that. Okay. Great, makes sense, just wanted to confirm. Um, based on identified community needs, I'm wondering if you have any current partnerships or planned partnerships with local community organizations to improve or address housing, food access, or transportation issues for Vermonters, particularly low income Vermonters in your community. This is Dr. McGraw, I'm happy to, to discuss that. We've been working very closely with Groundworks uh, uh, Collaborative, which is our local uh, homeless services organization, as well as um, with uh, the retreat and uh, ATRS specifically to look at issues around um, homelessness and how we can work with that. Our, um, uh, our, our folks in our community health team are also very focused on this, working with uh, uh, food insecurity. Uh, we have collaborated with Veggie Van Gogh and ensuring that that's here and available for our community as well. So all of these issues are things that we uh, think are really front and center to the health of our community and are and will continue to be involved with. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if One Care Vermont is involved in coordinating any of these efforts or if you partner with them at all. I will say we do, we have an accountable community for health um, group that meets regularly and certainly One Care is a part of that. We have a clinician. Um, and so it's really a bridge between all of the healthcare organizations and then the, the uh, human service agencies. Uh, so that's been very helpful. Oh, sorry, Jody Stack. Jody Stack, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, so this shifts a little bit more building off the conversation that we had earlier around workforce shortages and use of travelers. On page 12 of your narrative, you reported that you have 16 FDA nurse travelers at the moment. On the job listings website for Brattleboro, there are only two full-time RM positions open, 13 part-time and nine per diem. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. It seems like a discrepancy. I wonder if you could explain why that would be the case. It is. We try not to post duplicative um, positions. So if we have an emergency department position that's uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, 24 hours a week, and we have two of those, we post one. When we fill that, we post another one. Got it. Okay. And how do you go about deciding which nursing positions in particular to fill as a permanent or full-time position versus a contract, part-time, traveler contract? Because I know you spoke to wine to reduce that over time. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering how you make that calculus. I always want to fill our positions of full and part-time um, nurses. And, you know, just as the, the slide into bringing travelers back happens, once we start to get ahead of the curve, like we did in 2019 going into 20, um, and we're investing in our workforce and reducing travelers, we're able to spend more money, I mean, uh, more time and money on our own staff and not on the traveler. So it really does... <laughs> Um, grow because there's not just the financial cost of bringing in travelers, but it's an administrative burden. Um, mm -hmm. We're providing education that we really get no return um, on, and you know, onboarding is a constant cycle. So we always want to fill those positions with our own staff, mm -hmm. um, and so we only bring them in. It's not a one for one. You know, we bring them in when we just don't have the staff to meet the acute need. So we don't have contract temps in the ambulatory setting. Um, it's really in our progressive care unit and the emergency department, um, ORs and birthing center. Those are really the only places that we utilize. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And you spoke just building up the population health investments. You wrote in your narrative that there's limited patients 
with long-term population health investments, which don't yield short-term returns. So I'm wondering, that's both understandable, and I'm also wondering how you calculate that return on investment or lack thereof. And if so, what recommendations you have or kind of ideas to maximize short-term and also long-term? Because I think definitionally a lot of these, if I may editorialize a bit, a lot of these investments do take some time to materialize. So I'm just wondering how you go about calculating that ROI. But this is Chris Starty again, and, and actually, Sam, you stated it very well. I think what was we were trying to convey is up front, we're investing money into uh, population health management, and it's not going to have any impact in that current fiscal year, most likely. It's something that you're really investing in for the future to change the course of the health status of the population over time. Uh, so how we will measure that is, you know, right now we sit in one of the unhealthiest communities in the state of Vermont at this point in time. So seeing improvements in the health status of our community, seeing better management of chronicity uh, of illness in our community, hopefully seeing reduction in certain types of illnesses or the prevalence of certain illnesses due to investing in things like lifestyle medicine and other activities that will over time change the course uh, and costs of healthcare for this community, but not immediately. And, and that's what we were trying to convey is that we have to make the investments now uh, mm -hmm. in preparation for some return on investment in the future. Mm -hmm. Got it. I'm wondering if that investment becomes easier. Oh, go ahead. I think you're getting feedback, Sam. Oh, okay. Just didn't want to interrupt anybody. Um, I'm wondering if the partnership with One Care Vermont could help or does help in that area in terms of reducing that kind of risk of investment or what that relationship looks like. This is Chris Starty again, and yes, I, I do believe it helps, and I think it's something we want to capitalize on more and more and more. Uh, we uh, uh, They generate very good reports for our whole health services area, uh, which is very helpful to us, really emphasizing and focusing on preventative work that should be done, uh, and that's incredibly helpful. And I think constantly looking at ways to partner with um, uh, <laughs> With one care is is something vitally important to us because we do believe that you know ultimately we're going to be fully at risk uh, for the lives of patient, of the community and we embrace that challenge and uh, want to be well prepared for it and I think one care can be a very useful uh, uh, partner in that regard. Thank you. Just following up on the COVID um, nineteen reduction in services, I'm wondering if any services are still being reduced or if you're back to full capacity that this wasn't totally clear from the narrative. Sorry about that. This is Chris Starty again, and we are back fully at this point in time. Okay. Okay, great. And you also talked about the use of screeners. I'm just wondering if you could describe how they're currently being used and how long you anticipate using them. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris Starty again. So our screeners sit at the entrance to every one of our buildings. And it's really to, again, once again, screen to see if there are any prevalent COVID symptoms that we need to be aware of, uh, temperature checks, et cetera, and also making sure that the right PPE is in place, hand sanitizing as people come into the building. So it's really uh, something to try and keep everybody in this building as safe as possible uh, by uh, catching them as soon as they walk in the building. Everybody that is coming here electively also knows these protocols and are prepared for that. Our hope is, is if they have those symptoms, they're going to choose not to come in that day, but uh, it happens. And so it's it's just a chance to catch them before they walk through the doors and potentially expose our staff and other members of the community that happen to be here. Great. Makes sense. Last question for me, unless Charlie has any. Just wanted to provide an opportunity for you to answer one of the pre-hearing questions that we didn't see a response for, um, just to provide examples of any policies, procedures, and initiatives that your hospital has undertaken or plans to undertake to address systemic racism within your institution and community. I'm sorry we didn't answer that, Sam. This is Chris Starty again. That, that's my oversight. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, again, it's going to sound kind of like our patient family 
uh, advisory council, we, we had a very robust um, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion program uh, that was being worked on here. And then as COVID hit and changes in staffing hit, uh, it, it sort of uh, lost its real progress and momentum. We're right now reinvigorating that. Uh, we are, uh, again, looking at working not only with tremendous representation from our community that have a lot of expertise in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but we're also working with um, other health systems or looking to work with other health systems such, such as the Dartmouth, Dartmouth Health System, University of Vermont, Medical Center, uh, and other uh, national leaders in uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and healthcare. We've actually looked at some um, consultative firms as well that bring tremendous work in that regard. Uh, so we, we, we see this as a, a, a top priority for us at this point in time, and we're just starting to gain some traction in that regard. Great. Thank you. And I, no problem. And I do want to commend you for, I mean, relative to your size, you do have a dedicated DEI budget, which I think is important. I mean, I think resources and allocations track priorities. Um, so I want to recognize and commend you for that. Um, and in the health equity space, I appreciated the earlier, or we appreciated the earlier comment about committing more, trying to commit more of a share of uncompensated care converting to free care rather than bad debt. So we think at the HCA that has a big impact on access and affordability. Um, Charlie, I'll turn it over to you if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I do just have one follow-up question. Um, so this is uh, Charles Becker with the HCA, staff attorney with um, the, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, again, just thank you to the Brattleboro team for your presentation today. Um, my follow-up question is related to free care and bad debt, um, and it relates to some of the numbers on the income statement. So the income statement, and I apologize if this got asked previously, but so the income statement appears to show that 2022 budgeted free care was in the neighborhood of 2.8 million, and that projected uh, at a reduction of 77% to 635,000. So I'm just wondering if you, which is roughly parallel to what the 2021 actual was. And I'm just curious if you could speak to why there's that discrepancy in the budgeted to projected in the free care line on your income statement and what that might say about your 2023 budgeted uh, figure for free care, which is uh, the 2.7 million. <clears throat> yeah. like I, I I mentioned this is Andre this and that um, like I discussed before I, I kind of look at it as a complete bucket with bad debt and free care when you combine them um, it's more in line and what we've seen is that free care drop off when COVID hit that first round and it seems to still be down there um, so we've got to we've got to beef up and and see what we can do to do a better job to get those patients in to complete the applications we would much rather see those patients getting the free care than the bad debt. <clears throat> My experience is that um, patients will, if they're not on a free care program and they qualify, um, they'll put services off just because they, they don't want it. They're, they're almost you know embarrassed in the command that they're, they, they know they're using something and they're not able to pay for it type of thing. That That's in general what I've seen. So I would much rather get them on the free care um, charity program um, so that's kind of what's happened and, uh, you know, I'm budgeting. So for next year that that gets moved from bad debt over to free care. If I could just ask one more follow up to that, though, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing you say, which makes sense to me, that bad day, bad debt and free care are are one large bucket. Um, but but the bad debt line remains constant at uh, roughly three point eight million. So. I, I guess I'm still just struggling to see how there's a shift from from one to the other if the bad debt is remaining the same. Remaining the same. Well, yeah, and what's going to happen is with the fee increase that we've put in there, it's going to also increase that that line item in total. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of balancing it out um, over over the long run because <clears throat> it will it will I mean that's a big dollar amount of additional gross revenues. 
and when you write it off the free care or bad debt, it's that increased amount. So it's, it's trying to compensate for that additional dollar amount. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Great. So both you're both good. Okay. Fantastic. Well, at this point, I am going to just open it up to public comment. Is there anybody from the general public that would like to make a comment? If you do, you can just raise your hand on the Teams function. And I will see you. Is there anybody on the phone that wants to make a public comment? Another way to do it. You can just start speaking. All right, I am not hearing any. We're seeing any hands raised, so I'm going to assume that that Brattleboro, you did an amazing job of answering everybody's <laughs> question, including everybody out in the public who might possibly be <laughs> curious about something. Um, so thank you very much for coming today and sharing all of your updates with us. And you know, it was nice a chance to meet some of you. Um, and I really appreciate the time that you took to prepare your your proposals. And um, and there's a couple of follow up questions, but I know I have full faith that we'll see that, um, you know, in the next week or so. Hopefully, you know, Sarah will reach out to you. You bet. And we thank you. We thank you for your time. Good luck with your new role and endeavor. And uh, um, we really look forward to partnering with you all to make a healthier Vermont. Thank you. We will look forward to that. Um, so board members and team here, we are, that's one day down. We have uh, two hospitals done and a, a lot more to go, 12 more to go. So I look forward to seeing everybody back here. We will be back here at 8.30 a.m. on Wednesday um, and we'll be hearing from Grace Cottage, Springfield and Northwestern. And the day was extended a bit to make more time for board questions, which I think were a little cut short on the original schedule. So I appreciate that from the staff to help make that happen. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll take that as a move and a seconded simultaneously. <laughs> take your pick. Any, I'm, any discussion on that wonderful motion? No. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nope. All right. We are adjourned for the day, and I will see everybody back online at 8.30 on Wednesday morning. Thank you all, and thanks to the hospital budget team for all your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bladderball. Thank you.